everyone. I'm Avi Rao. Um, so Edward and I, uh, this summer, um, um, so yeah, Edward and I, this summer, we were uh, at NCSA for eight weeks. And both of us had our own uh, research process that we were working on. Um, so I was supervised by Professor Kendra Tenko. And um, yeah, so this program was great. It got it gave me a chance to you know travel across uh, the U.S. and um, learn learn very interesting things. So um, so yeah, so my project was fall detection, and the motivation for this is that um, in places such as such as old age homes or places where elderly people live, um, falls can be uh, uh, can cause severe injuries and can even be fatal. Um, so the goal was to uh, create an end-to-end -end system that can, uh, taking a uh, live input video, um, predict whether someone has fallen down or not. Um, so some of the existing work in this area um, was uh, using, um, so some of it was based on using sensors and um, things like using uh, accelerometer data to um, first detect whether um, someone has fallen, and if the accelerometer data triggers uh, a possibility that someone has fallen, um, using a connect sensor, you uh, you extract a depth map, and from this, uh, you extract more features that can be fed into an SVM classifier. Um, so, uh, so, I mean, another, I guess, SVM approach in this area was um, simply using and the image of the room and extracting the person um, and I guess feeding features of that image into the SVM classifier again. Um, so, I mean, the previous approach, which, which I just discussed regarding using depth maps, the good thing about it was it, was, it, would, it would preserve privacy because it wouldn't take, I guess, RGB images of the room. So people were, uh, yeah, so it was privacy preserving. Um, then I guess another approach was using um, 3D convolutions and LSTM networks. So a 3D convolution uh, network would extract, I guess, temporal or spatial features, and the LSTM would be used to detect activity across frames. Um, so this was some of the existing work related uh, to fall detection. Some of the problems were that uh, for example, to accurately detect, uh, I guess, whether someone has fallen, they would have to wear the sensor around this center of mass, which would like be around their waist, which could be uncomfortable for some people. Um, and I mean, the approaches generated many false alarms too, which was, um, I guess, uh, uncomfortable too. Um, and the approach that I used, um, was uh, one that um, gen that had that performed like state of the art results in the literature. So I I was using that approach to develop the end to end system. Um, and before I go more into that, I just wanted to uh, just explain uh, this idea of optical flow, which is basically um, if so. The approach that I used wasn't using an LSTM, so to detect activity across frames, we use optical flow, which, um, which basically, um, as you can see in this image, um, this there's a sequence of frames where the person's falling down, and the optical flow algorithm would uh, detect the activity of the person, and this would be fed into the network. Um, so, the this is sort of the uh, approach that I was using, um, and um, so basically the workflow was you take these RGB images, um, you generate your optical flow images and feed a stack of it into a feature extractor, which would essentially generate out um, a feature vector, which could then be fed into a uh, fully connected uh, neural network, which should finally make a prediction of whether there was a fall or not. Um, so yeah, so this, this approach used the VGG network, which um, which was pre-trained on the ImageNet dataset. So 
the SVGG network was modified to firstly um, accept a stack of images rather than a single image. And it was retrained uh, on the UCF 101 data set. Um, so the, this data set is essentially a collection of YouTube videos uh, for the purpose of activity recognition. Um, so the goal is by transfer learning is to teach the VGG network to extract features relevant for activity recognition. Um, so yeah, like I said, this method achieved state-of-the-art results in three major fall detection data sets. So this is why I tried to implement this the most. Yeah, so key points, optical flow to detect motion and using a modified VGG uh, model. Uh, and yeah, at the end, a fully connected classifier. Um, so the so I was trying to develop an end-to-end -end system, and so the uh, hardware that I mainly sort of tried to deploy it on onto was the NVIDIA Jetson TX2, and this is a uh, this is a low-power consumption board with the Tegra system on chip. Um, it had an onboard GPU too. Um, um, so this uh, kind of like a Raspberry Pi, it allowed to set up a full environment where you could, I guess, do your development and um, allowed to, it, it also like set up like major libraries that you would need for performing inference, like OpenCV, CUDA, and um, also TensorRT. Um, so now TensorRT, um, is a library for uh, performing inference, uh, specifically on NVIDIA hardware. Um, and so the reason you need a separate, I guess, library framework uh, to perform inference rather than using uh, the uh, existing deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow or Keras um, are because um, usually these deep learning frameworks have their the format of the models are optimized for training. Um, and often it's uh, infeasible to perform inference on uh, hardware that may have limited resources like computing power or memory. So TensorRT essentially takes your deep learning framework, uh, sorry, your deep learning model, um, and uh, it converts it to an optimized form for that specific um, hardware. And it, yeah, it allows a lot more, um, I guess, uh, fine-grained control to optimize its performance. Like, um, it, one thing it allows to do is controlling floating point precision that your uh, that your model uses. So by default, Tensor RT uses 32-bit uh, floating point numbers. You can Tensor RT allows you to lower that to 16-bit uh, floating point numbers and even uh, down to 8-bit integers uh, to improve performance and speed. Um, and yeah, you can do things like uh, control, like, I guess, uh, asynchronously performing inference so that you can do other things in your code while your model's doing inference. Um, so the basic workflow of TensorRT is you take your trained neural network you uh, run a TensorRT optimizer to, um, for, uh, to create a runtime engine. Um, and this runtime engine uh, is a, yeah, so it's a runtime object that you would load into your code and um, use to perform inference. And so TensorRT, uh, it's, uh, it provides a C++ and a Python API. I mostly stuck to using Python because it just made uh, uh, data manipulation easier uh, with all the existing uh, Python libraries. Um, this is the um, camera that I used, which was um, specifically was designed for Jetson TX2. Um, it was uh, yeah, it was a it was a pretty good camera, uh, even better than one on my phone. Um, so it uh, yeah it allows uh, recording in multiple modes. Um, um, and another thing, just I guess a point to note about this is this camera required an older version of the software that's currently um, like an older version of the software that you uh, compared to the latest 
uh, version available for your NVIDIA Jetson. Um, so just a small note about that. Um, I actually also used uh, OpenVINO, which is uh, a framework for uh, performing inference on uh, Intel hardware. So the workflow is essentially the same. You take your train model and uh, <clears throat> you convert it to an intermediate representation, which you then use for uh, performing inference. Um, it too had uh, Python C++ uh, APIs available. And I, just from my experience of using it, um, I found that TensorRT allowed for more fine-grained control to optimize its performance, your model's performance, I mean. Um, yeah, so I used OpenMino with this, the UP squared device. Uh, essentially, yeah, it's the hardware that was developed. It's hardware that's developed by Intel. Uh, it came with OpenMino set up and did it with a GPU available, but I, the one that I was using didn't have one. Um, and yeah, I, I later on just switched to using the NVIDIA board since it uh, gave uh, higher performance because of the onboard GPU. So, um, yeah, so TensorRT and OpenVINO, uh, they both, like I said, you take your uh, deep learning um, model and you convert it into an optimized form. So they, they both support uh, the common like deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow or CAFE. Um, OpenVINO just gives a bit more direct support for a few others, a few other deep learning frameworks. But um, one thing to note is if you want to use, uh, I guess, um, some other format that TensorRT and OpenVINO don't directly support, you need to use something called ONNX. And so that's just my next slide on that. So yeah, so ONNX is uh, like a format that you can use to convert between different deep learning frameworks. Um, the, reason, uh, the reason why you might want to use something like this is because different deep learning frameworks give, have different capabilities. So something like TensorFlow or PyTorch, they allow you to define complicated network architectures um, or novel network architectures. Or if you wanted to use something, or if you use something like Keras, that would, uh, it's, it's very easy to use API will allow you to quickly bring like develop just define a network and train it and use it for whatever you want. Um, and something like maybe um, TensorFlow Lite, which is used for performing inference on mobile phones. So maybe you use maybe you use some deep learning framework at some stage of your development and at some point to deploy it, you need another deep learning framework. And so to convert between these formats, you use you use ONNX. So it provides like a common underlying representation for the computational graph. Uh, so yeah, um, the, well, and essentially my approach uh, to the whole, uh, the one that I, my approach that I ended up overall with was I took my, um, so the feed, the VGG, uh, model that is the feature extractor. I I trained these in Keras and also the fully connected uh, classifier at the end. I trained both of them in Keras and converted into an O and X format. And yeah, so the so TensorRT has a O and X parser that can uh, read your O and X format and uh, build an entrance engine. So. Essentially, the, uh, the workflow to just detect falls in real time is pretty straightforward. You read an image from your camera and you build an image stack and feed it into a network and obtain a prediction and just repeat. Um, so that was, that's what I had at the end. Um, and I used yeah, the TensorRT API to perform entrance and used OpenCV to manipulate images and to also compute optical flow. Um, this was what I had at the end, and um, I guess over the eight weeks, some of the issues that I like that occurred were I initially started working with UP squared, uh, but 
because it didn't have an onboard GPU, it, uh, it provided, uh, it, it didn't have as much of a performance uh, as the NVIDIA Jensen. So I switched to the NVIDIA. Um, and initially I was actually working with, uh, rather than Keras models, I was working with TensorFlow models. Um, when I was trying to deploy them onto the NVIDIA Jetson. Um, but um, so the inbuilt parser for TensorFlow models in TensorRT um, actually doesn't support many layers. So you have to define them yourself in TensorRT. Um, and due to this, I kind of just switched to working with ONNX because the ONNX parser in, um, in TensorRT was, it supported more layers. Um, so, and I also, at some point I was trying to in, use the 3D convolution network as well, um, to, uh, to perform inference. However, uh, a certain, like certain Keras layers were not, could not be parsed into ONNX. Um, so, uh, this was just a, I guess, just a limitation of ONNX, uh, and yeah, uh, because of this, I was mostly working with the VGT based approach. Um, and another issue that I was running into uh, was that the model wouldn't actually, um, it wouldn't make correct predictions. So the, the issue that I identified later was the optical flow algorithm that I was using was, uh, was different to the one that was used to train the model. And, um, so I did actually attempt to use the original, I guess, the library that the authors of the paper used. Um, however, I, the, like, I just had like lots of challenges with just getting the library to run and build. And I think it was just partly due to how, like, how old it was and um, it was just like a GitHub repository that wasn't really maintained that much. Um, but yeah, if I had more time, that's the part that I would work on, just getting the optical scroll algorithm right and uh, feeding the right input into the model. Um, but yeah, that's, that's kind of, I guess, brings me to the end of my slide. Uh, yeah, there are no more slides. Uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, no, it was it was a great time. I, I really want to thank uh, David and Jay and everyone at uh, NCSA and RCC for, I guess, organizing this. Um, it, was, it was really cool. And yeah, I would highly recommend it to, I guess, I, I can only see two students here, or one. Yeah, but yeah, <laughs> I recommend it to you guys if you guys are doing it. But, yeah. So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, so in a similar fashion to Arby Real, I'll be talking all about my Quopa project for the January and February. Um, and my project's all about scaling um, deep learning models in astrophysics. Uh, so it was an eight week research internship at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And um, so this, this campus is situated about two and a half hours south of Chicago. Um, so yeah, that's where we were for two months. Um, and it was at NCSA, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Um, and it's kind of like similar to RCC in a way. So <laughs> a little bit bigger, but <laughs> <laughs> they cover many disciplines of research. So visualization, biology, physics, AI, and um, they're involved. They involve themselves with like industry partners to um, always work with the latest technology. Um, this is NCSA, except um, when we were there, you can picture like snow where <laughs> over all the grass. Uh, so just a bit about um, bit about me, some, so you understand like where I came from going to this to this project. So I'm a mathematics student, um, mostly doing statistics and computer science over three years before um, this program. And I was introduced to high-performance computing through the UQ's COSC 3500 subject. Um, and yeah, I'm actually new. I was new to research at the time, like working on a like a, a big research project. And um, probably ironically, I was new to neural networks. Um, so I've learned a lot in this time. 
So my, as I said, my project all about um, scaling machine le machine learning models in astrophysics. Um, in other words, like parallel parallelizing the training of these models. Um, and in general, problems in astrophysics can be quite um, high in complexity computationally. So, and that's because you're usually modeling um, space time coordinates. So like a region of space at every point in time. Um, and there's usually a lot of parameters in your model to um, estimate. So running these models, it could take on like a single computer, it could take a very long time, very long time, depending on how accurate or um, like how much, how big of a problem you want to tackle. So it could take days to weeks. And um, so my goal is to be able to parallelize this training um, to many GPUs and cut down this training time. Um, so there are a few models that I worked on. Um, I'll come back to explain them later, but my most of my work was more around the computational side. So I'm not a like I not a physicist either. So um, yeah, I'll stress that. So my team was the Gravity Group, and it was um, it's led by my supervisor Elu, um, who's not on the call. Um, and this group, they the research areas they focus on is gravi gravitational wave astrophysics, astrodynamics and multi-messenger astrophysics. So they're typically modeling um, black holes and neutron stars. So going back to um, the question of what a gravitational wave is for people that don't know, it's these, um, it's these ripples in space time that can be caused by events like black holes um, in orbit with each other and merging. So um, they, we can actually measure these ripples in space time. Um, and this is this gravitational wave at the bottom left. Um, so when they're, when, they're, when they're just in orbit there, you get like a, um, like a periodic function. And then once they start to merge, then your gravitational, gravitational wave is, um, it increases. And then once they've merged, you see that drop in the gravitational, gravitational waves. So this is, um, we first, we only first observed gravitational waves in the past decade, but so it's a pretty recent um, research area. Um, and so Gravity Group, they, um, they use deep learning to analyze these gravitational waves and um, so you can see in this um, bottom right diagram that um, depending on like the configurations of two black holes um, merging, they can produce um, many different types of signals um, that we are trying to analyze. So um, what these models do is basically going from the wave back and then from, from the from the gravitational wave to the, um, try to estimate try to go back and estimate what these um, like what the masses what this configuration is so what the masses of the black holes are and like whether what the spins of the black holes are um, and yeah that's that's the gist of um, the first kind of models. I also worked on um, another model, which was to classify images of galaxies, but this one was more so to um, show that like we could successfully scale models um, on NCSA's technology. So um, one of the first things I did when I got to NCSA was um, sign myself up to their NCSA is how cluster. So it's one of their more recent and more experimental um, pieces of technology. Um, it's, I think they're supported by IBM. So they, they, um, it consists of 60 nodes, which each, each have four NVIDIA um, Tesla V100 GPUs, which are 
like the most recent, the state of the art GPUs that you can find in the most powerful supercomputers. And I think um, your Weiner supercomputer RCC has these um, GPUs. And it, it, this um, it includes like the IBM Power, for, Power AI platform, which is your is a family of um, software packages which allow you to do all of these all this machine learning. Um, it is similar in architecture to Summit, the most the currently most powerful computer. And I'll actually go back to that later. Um, so my first milestone of this project was to try to um, scale these models onto the Howe cluster. Um, so 60, up to 64 GPUs, and then um, and then there's more to come after that. So there's a there's many frameworks available in order to distribute your training. Um, the two that I used were Horovod and Apex, but there's many others, um, such as I think TensorFlow has its own native distributed training framework and. There's also IBM's DDL framework. So Horovod, sorry, Horovod, it's, um, it was developed by Uber. It works with um, several machine learning libraries like TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Keras. I used it for TensorFlow in this case. And the way that it works is um, utilizing MPI and Nickel um, to perform like ring, Ring reducing. Um, yeah, they they perform. Yeah, they re they they reduce in this way, which um, is gives us pretty good results. Um, and Apex, it's developed by Nvidia. It only works with PyTorch, um, and it uses this method called automatic mixed precision, which. Um, to be honest, I don't know, I, I can't explain much about it, but it's, um, it allows you to um, process, um, get a higher throughput, and it's um, been shown to like give you very good speed ups when you're um, distributing your training. And so both, both frameworks are quite simple to implement once you've got your, um, your model running on a single GPU. So it usually requires initializing the library and then um, tweaking your optimizer. And um, one thing you're gonna make sure is that with your data input, you have a way to be able to um, split your data into all the um, different nodes. Uh, Um, so now talking about what I did at NTSA. So um, obviously I was implementing the GPU frameworks into the existing models. Um, so once I did that, I it was time to test these models. So in, it involved running a lot of code on the cluster, um, like changing the number of nodes and then gathering um, several different performance metrics, such as like the average throughput, the time per epoch, um, and how well the models were um, reducing in loss as we increased the number of GPUs. Um, so it can, the, these jobs can be pretty long. They could range from anywhere between a few hours to a few days. So um, there's like a lot of waiting you have to do to gather, gather your results and just one thing about deep learning, um, sometimes you just have to basically trial and error um, and like see to see like whether you, you're getting better results. Um, so in the end, um, I was able to successfully um, scale all these models on Hal's cluster. So um, one example, one plot that was produced is this one on the right. So um, you can see like it's we're achieving pretty pretty linear scaling, um, and you can't really see much um, 
much decreases in your efficiency as you as you increase number of GPUs. And that's partly to thank the hardware of Hell. It's very, very, very recent. Um, but so now what's next is to go further with these models. So that, um, that involves, um, we want to run it on more GPUs and open up the scope of the problem. So, so far running these models on HAL, um, we actually restricted our problem domain um, and that just because it's like a, such a large problem. So now that we have more GPUs, we can open up to the whole problem. So problems are encountered um, in this program. So fortunately, Horobot and Apex, they were like they're developed by pretty smart people. So it's, um, they do the hard work for you. Um, and if, if you've got like a good data input and you've got a decent model, then it can be hard to, and good hardware, it can be difficult to mess up here. Um, but as you increase the number of GPUs, you may need to do some minor tweaks such as like um, tweaking like the learning rate and other hyperparameters. Um, some other problems, there are some other problems like um, in one case the loss of our model wasn't decreasing, it wasn't converging um, as we increased the number of GPUs but this, this was more of a problem with the model, not, not really with um, the scaling of it. Uh, and yeah, there was also a um, pretty major bug on how where Horobod wouldn't wasn't able to scale on the full cluster, just some nodes it was it was unsupported. Um, I'm not sure if we resolved that problem. Okay, so life outside NCSA. Um, so during this two months, I was able to do a bit of traveling um, and I also got to do a tour of a tour of NTSA's Blue Waters supercomputer. So it's, um, it's pretty impressive, um, pretty impressive building and like a massive room with all your, all your, um, that holds your cluster. So these Photos here are um, during my tour at the Blue Waters computer. Um, then um, I was able to go to Chicago. So there's a picture of Chicago, and I was also able to do some skiing in Canada and to Niagara Falls. So it was, yeah, it was a lot of fun outside of um, outside the project as well. So now, now that we've, um, so at the moment, we're, we've only, we're only at the stage where we've successfully scaled on how. Um, the future plan is to go further and we're actually, um, we want to run these models on Summit. So, yeah, so now we're, we have 64 GPUs so far and we want to scale that up to, um, hundreds of GPUs and that's that's estimated to proceed like um, end of this quarter or into the next quarter. So stay tuned for that. And just final highlights and summary. So I thought this program was a great opportunity to work with researchers in another part of the world. And there's definitely something um, different about doing this program um, compared to just like doing a summer internship at UQ. Like the clear difference there. Um, uh, I was, it allowed me to dive into real high performance computing problems and um, use AI for scientific research. I met a lot of great people at NCSA. Um, and yeah, I'm keen for the future results of this project as it continues. Um, so, I also want to thank everyone at NCSA for hosting, hosting this program um, and David for allowing me to go on this trip, um, but yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs>